So, hey, we are in the midst of this series. We're in 2 Timothy. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you might want to get them ready. We're going to be in 2 Timothy beginning in chapter 2. Um, this is all under what the Lord's been doing in this, this house of worship called Vision 2020, Expect Greater Things. It's been based off of John 14. And in John 14, we see Jesus make a few promises. Well, it's kind of the same. It, there's sort of like two aspects of the same promise. Um, he's like, you're going to do the same things that, that I do. I think we have that verse, Richard. Do we have John 14? You're going to... You're going to do the same things that I do. If we don't, that's okay. I may have taken it off the slides. You hear it every week, so you guys probably memorize it by now. Jesus promised, you're going to do the same things that I do and even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And what we're doing is we're believing that the greater things that we're going to get to do because Jesus is filling us with his Holy Spirit is in the work of evangelism, is in the work of seeing dead people spiritually be resurrected and come to life in Christ. As a matter of fact, we are going to be celebrating several of those today in, in the courtyard with baptisms. That's, I got my baptism shirt on. I'm ready to go. It is, we got the AC dunk tank ready. Boom. It's going to be awesome. And we've got a, a few people in our midst today that uh, we're going to ask all of you, grab your kids after service, all of you, come over to where our offices are. They're just a little bit um, east on campus. There's a courtyard area there with a little bit more shade than we, where we did it last time. And we just want to all celebrate new life together because it's a family thing. It's not just an individual thing. It's a family thing. And, and so we're believing that these are the greater works that God has called us to do and today we're actually getting to see the fruit of it. Do you know that sometimes God makes promises that you don't always get to see the fruit of? You understand that. I mean, we will eventually, but there are some things that God promises that are, that are like reserved for when he comes back again. Like he promises to give Jerry a new body. He was in a wheelchair for far too long. And this is a promise to Jerry that one day that wheelchair will, it'll be like a distant memory that he was actually, there's actually more glory that came to God and more joy that comes to his heart because of it. And he's going to remember that, but he's not going to remember it from a seated position. He's going to remember it from a fully capable, amazing, beautiful body. That's a promise that he's about, he's about, he's going to receive when he comes back. Absolutely. <laughs> Some of the promises are yet to be. Some of them we're getting to see even in our midst. When we baptize these people, that's like God saying, I'm doing it. I told you I was going to do it. I'm doing it. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. Um, part of this, this Vision 2020 is this, uh, this idea that for us, we're going to need some cultural shifts here at the Avenue Church. We're going to need to shift some things. We've been talking about different cultural shifts. And, and this series is all about a shift from ownership to empowerment. How, not, not how can we own more or how can we work harder, but how can we train others more effectively so that they advance the gospel more than we ever could. I mean, that's where Jesus gets this promise about how we're going to do greater things. Is the body of Christ will take the gospel further than the person of Christ did in his three-year ministry. And we're seeing it to be proved true over and over and over. I mean, just look at the many, many people who have come to faith since the resurrection of Christ, much more than in his three years of ministry. He said it was going to happen, and it's happening. One of the keys to this happening is this idea of empowerment, this idea of us being a people who learn to give it away. That's actually one of the ways we flourish in it, is we get better at giving it away. Defining empowerment from Cambridge Dictionary goes like this, the process of gaining freedom and power to do what you want to do. Now, this might seem self-serving, so let, I always preface it with, hey, this is, this is empowering. This is one believer, like the Apostle Paul in this letter, empowering another believer to do what they now want to do because their appetites have changed. They're filled with the Spirit, God's, God's love, God's purpose, God's passion has come to live on Timothy in the word that we're going to see here. And now he actually wants to do the things of God. He struggles. He's got flesh that's not always right and doesn't always have the right motives. But when we start talking about gospel empowerment, what we're saying is that there are people around us who need freedom and power to do what they actually want to do now in Christ. And what God does is he uses us to give it away so that they can experience more of God and give it away and give it away and give it away. Okay, so being able to give somebody the power and freedom to do what they want just means connecting them more to the heart of God so that they can live out the fulfillment of their ministry. 
We each have different individual callings on our life. And this is not about us creating a menu for everyone to follow and say, these are the four things you get to pick from. I'm, I'm like super tired of creating the menu. I, as, a, as, a, as a church guy, that's what I've done for a lot of my time is like create the menu and hope people go to it. Actually stop you from doing where, what you're doing what you're, and try to get you interested in these four or five things. But the gospel is so much more freeing and so much more powerful than that. Rather than telling you what you want to do, I just want to get involved in your life. I want to pour into you and I want to see what God wants you to do and then empower you and give you freedom to do that. That's what Paul is doing to Timothy here. Now, you want to go ahead and, and, and open your Bibles. The goal of this, there's, there's a couple of different goals, if you will, but, but sort of the overarching word that we've been using in this series is this idea of being disruptive. Being disruptive. Um, now, that's not always a cool thing, right? Like, we don't always love disruptive people. It makes it harder and more complicated to get done what we want to do sometimes when there's disruptive people there. But when I look at the history and ministry of Jesus, I don't see anybody who was more disruptive than him. He was radically disruptive. He, he, he disrupted the systems that were in place that people didn't realize were oppressive, mainly the religious system that was all about what you had to do in order to earn your way to God. And Jesus just disrupts that like crazy I mean, you know he's the same guy who came into the religious setting and upturned all the tables, right? Okay, well, he does that, like, symbolically as well when it comes to the religious system, when he's like, listen, you can't do it. This is not a Rocky pep talk, like, get back in there, Rock, cut me, Mick, keep trying. Jesus is like, if you fight sin and you approach the end of your life and you're like Jerry who now stands before the Father and is like, I'm gonna fight my way into heaven because I was such a good fighter of my sin, you will lose. Jesus is like, there's no way that any of us will ever measure up to the perfection of God and God will, even the most like rockiest of us all, the, the toughest, like most hardcore, sold out, legalistic, routine oriented religious person will lose their battle to sin in eternity in hell. Because God is holy and perfect, and, and He can't, He cannot, He cannot allow for our hearts that are all corrupted by sin to enter into His presence. And so here's what Jesus says. I'm going to disrupt you trying harder, and I'm going to say, listen, don't try harder. Just come to me. Just get behind me. I'm going to go to a cross and pay for your sin. I'm going to do what you can't do. I will die the death that you were supposed to die. And here's what happened. Here's a beautiful transaction that Jerry knew well. He knew it well. Late in life, he knew it well. That although Jerry did not stand perfect and righteous before a holy God, Jesus Christ did. And on that cross, Jerry got to trade his heart for the heart of Christ. And the Father punished Christ so that Jerry, through the death and resurrection of Christ, could go free, be forgiven, and be made new in Christ. That's the gospel message that Jerry understands way more now than he ever did on this side of heaven, but he knew it pretty well over here, didn't he? Those of you who knew him. This is exactly what Jesus came in to disrupt. He's like, you gotta quit trying hard. You will die separated from God that way. You come to me. You trust me. You get behind my finished work. You repent, which means change your mind, change your heart, turn from this life outside of me and trust me as your treasure, as your savior, as your defender. I am enough, period, end of sentence. No in parentheses, and you've got to keep trying harder after you do that. Come to me again and again and again, and I will be your savior. This is the mindset of what makes us disruptive, at least wholly disruptive. This is the mindset of what then sends us out into the world to be like who Timothy is being called to be in this letter. So we're gonna read a portion of it here today, and it was written as a letter from Paul to Timothy, okay? And so we're gonna read a, a pretty large portion of it. Sometimes we read smaller portions of it, but you know a letter, if I wrote you a letter in the mail, I don't think my kids even know what that is, okay? So like you wouldn't, you wouldn't get it on your phone. There's this person 
that drives around or walks around, they put little like things in a box and then you have a key or you go and you open that box and, and then there's, there's things and you, there, there's sticky things that you've got to open and then there's something inside, those are called letters, okay? And so there's a whole generation that doesn't know much about like snail mail, but, but that's, that's what this was. This was like snail mail and it was not meant to be written. If I wrote you a letter, you wouldn't read a portion of it and then like go hang out for a couple of days, right? You would read the whole letter and you might go back and read portions, but you would read the whole letter as a letter. So we're going to read a pretty large portion today and then we're going to go back and see what the Lord has to say for us, not only in that context, but also in our context. All right. Beginning in 2 Timothy, and we'll just pick up from where we left off last week. Verse 14, Paul writes from a jail cell to his young apprentice, Timothy. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Chapter three, now there were no chapters in the letter. It just kept, it just kept going. But understand this, that in the last days there will come some times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never being able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. All right, let's get after it. Whoa. So what we have here, we got some passages are like, give me an A, give me a C. You know, like they start spelling out things like super encouraging. Like, you can do it, man. As a matter of fact, next week, Mitch, where's Mitch? He's, you know, Mitch. He's, he's probably fixed up doing something, making sure the building's not collapsing right now. Mitch, <laughs> Mitch next, week, next week is preaching, and he's preaching on encouragement, okay? And so this is a guy who knows about encouragement. He, next week is going to be all about the empowering encouragements that we can give to one another. This week is about empowering warnings. Warnings. 
You know, sometimes the most loving thing you can do to somebody is actually see something they can't see and then warn them about it before they go and get crushed. So warnings, warnings. There's some signs for warnings, right? Richard, can we show some of those signs that we've got for warnings? Okay, so we're, we're familiar uh, with, with warnings, right? And, and so this is one sign for warning. I don't know what it means. I think it's like, don't rob my house or something. Because, you know, like this guy I think is supposed to be sketchy, but then he's giving the warning. I'm super confused on this one. But it's a warning sign, like stop. And so sometimes, uh, sometimes our, our warnings are like, stop, don't do that. You heard in that passage, avoid such people, right? So, so sometimes they're just like, no more. You can't, it's not good for you. You got to stop. So let's see the next one. Sometimes, I have no idea what this means either, but sometimes they're like, you got to be careful. I think that's like a river and you might slip if you go by the river or something. Or maybe that's like a, hey, go get baptized. I don't know. Because he's like, so if I was, you know what I'm saying? But I don't know what that means. Besides, bes- do you, does anybody really know what that means? Ice? Is, slippery. Slippery when wet? You Bon Jovi fans, you. Okay. So listen, this doesn't mean stop. This means like, you'll be careful. You know, it's yellow, right? It's like, ah, you know, so I guess if you're, if it's going to be slippery, it's not like you can't go out there. It's just that if you do go out there, watch out because you might slip easily. Okay, so this isn't a stop warning. This is a, hey, heads up. This is coming. You heard in this letter, in the last days. You can't stop the last days. They're coming, Timothy. Just be careful because things are going to get slippery. And how about this, how about this one? I think we probably all know what this one is, right? Like the, the whole rip current type thing. And, and this is a warning. This, one, this one's interesting. This is a warning where it's like, um, okay, if you get caught in this situation, here's what to do. So it's not like saying don't go swimming, don't go to the beach. It, it's, it's saying if this happens, here's what you are to do. Kind of go this way and then go that way. And this is where your safety is. Listen, I know because I've done it. I've been caught here. I've already lived this. I have information you don't need to learn the hard way. Listen to me. I love you. If this happens, this is what you do. You don't even need to think about it. Sometimes when we spend so much time thinking about what to do and we're in the situation, it like crushes us like this. If I find myself in the midst of the rip current and I'm thinking about, well, I wonder if I should go this way or that way, or maybe I should just like let this thing just carry me out. That'd be fun. Where, I wonder where I'll end up. Like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. But we have a warning that says, I've already been here. This is what you do. Different warnings have different things. And so today we're going to take a look at some of the elements of empowering warnings. That's what we're doing in this series. What we're saying is that this, here's the deal. We've been called, this is a, this is a, a series that's, fir- the first audience are the Pauls here. Those men and women, boys and girls, it doesn't, age doesn't matter. What matters is you've, you've walked in the Lord for a bit. You know both the gospel person of Jesus and the gospel power of Jesus. And, and now it's time to give it away. And actually, the sooner the better. The sooner, it's not like, oh, well, you got five, you got to walk in Christ five years. No, no, no. You've got to walk in Christ enough to know your identity in Christ, who you are in Christ, and to know that part, a big part of your discipleship is to actually give it away. When you get to that point, then you need to start thinking about who else can I empower? Where else can I give it away? The second audience is Timothy's, the Timothy's among us. Those of us who are like, we're super new in the faith. They're, they're, we're, we're putting it together every week. Maybe we just started coming to church, whatever the case may be. This is for you guys and girls to, to learn, okay, this is what it means to be in a really healthy relationship where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to grow in this thing that I'm se- sensing is the most important thing I've got going in my life. Okay, so, so two different audiences here. And, and um, so wh- wherever you might be, we want you to, to take this in from that perspective. And then there's the, the third audience where it's like, I don't know about the Jesus thing yet. You know, like I just, this was better than where I had to be somewhere else. So I chose the Avenue Church, you know. That's awesome, you guys. Welcome. We love you. 
we super love you. And if, th and if that's how you just want to hang out with us, that's super cool. But listen, we will always invite you to the person Jesus, okay? Because that's what we're all about. And that's really why you're here. Hey, elements of empowering warning. What are we, what are we looking at here? What, 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 what are we going to come, come away with? First of all, and you've got an outline that might help you. And there's some blanks if you're a fill-in-the-blank type person. The first one is that, it, um, that they're richly relevant. Richly relevant. I don't remember how long we had been in the ministry. Uh, I, don't, I don't even remember if, I think maybe we had launched, I don't know. But uh, I had this uh, friend of mine who was an older guy, and he's sort of like a, um, like a, uh, a football pastor. I don't know if that's a great illustration, but he's the kind of pastor who would call you like boy, and you would like it. You know, like it's not, he would get around me, he was older, and he, he, he could say boy, and then he could say whatever he wanted, and I'd be like, yes, sir. Like, and I wouldn't feel condemned, I wouldn't feel, he just had that way about me. And he had that way with people. He was like this loving father who was just, could just say some gruff things, and it was super cool. Uh, his name is Pastor Seer. And if you know Pastor Seer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We might even have some of his family here with us today. We got any Pastor Seer family right there? I see you back there. Yeah, cool. Uh, so here's what he said. He's like, hey, I got some gear to give you. This is when we didn't, like, okay, we didn't have any th really thing, you know? And, and he's like, I got some music gear to give you. And I'm like, all right, cool. So we met at the, at the place where he had his gear, and he had a church, and he had planted a church and stuff like that. And we're loading up the gear. And at this time, you know, as a church planner early on, you, gotta, you don't have much besides like some dreams and visions and aspirations, right? Like that's about, that's about the totality of what I had. Uh, maybe, maybe some people who were crazy enough to kind of hang out with you at the beginning, but you, you don't have a lot of stuff, right? You don't have a great plan. But, but you in your mind, your mind is ready to go. So I'm meeting with this guy, and we're there to, to hit him to give me the equipment, which was a really cool gift. And I, I'll never forget this conversation. I don't know what he's going to tell me. He usually had a sermon for me every time we met. Even if it was over gear, he was going to tell me something from the Lord, and that was super cool. And today, he, in this particular day, he, he told me something that served as both an encouragement, but it had like a warning twinge to it, and I think it served me really well. And I don't think he said boy before he started. But he was like, hey, you know, Jesus cares more about you than your ministry. Really? Because I got big plans for this ministry. I mean, we're going we're gonna to do this. Like, like we're, we're going to turn the world upside down. You don't, you don't understand, right? Like this, like this, the Lord has called me to this place. And, and he's called me to, to these people, man. Like, we are going to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to this place. And it's going to, like, radically change the city and eternity forever. Jesus cares way more about you, Casey, than your ministry. Man, that was a, that was a warning and an encouragement that served my heart well and has helped, I believe, to shape the way that we've moved forward as a church and I've moved forward as like a dad and a son of the living king and a brother and a friend. The fact that, that Jesus, although he cares deeply and desperately about his bride and about the gospel going forward and the health of the church, all those, it's not that he didn't, what, he's, what he was saying is like, if you go down, that, that Jesus' heart gets broken. This goes down. He's like, he, Jesus is coming after you first before any big city or nation. He cares more about you, Casey, than your ministry. Because as we got into the ministry, although there may be people asking, how's your family? Although there may be people celebrating the metrics of the happiness of my heart. Although there may be people asking, you know, about like, what, what can we do to, to make sure that you're growing in Christ? You know what's the easiest metric? When, when people get around me in sort of church settings to ask, how's the church? How many are coming? What's, what, what, what new thing is going on? Like, what's, what's the vision? What's this? What's that? All metrics that are really super important, but all things that could actually be happening while I'm dying on the inside. But I had a warning. As a young 36 or 7-year-old, I don't know how old I was, that told me, that guarding my heart was going to be more important than being an awesome pastor. 
richly relevant. Richly relevant, which means um, if, if we're going to have empowering warnings that don't just sound like, um, you know, Charlie Brown when he gets on the phone with the adults. You know what the sound comes out when, when, when he gets on the phone? Can we do it on the count of three? One, two, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what warnings sound like if they're not relevant, you know? Like if you get around people who are just like, you know, um, make sure you read your Bible after you plant your church. Hey, make sure to, you know, make, make good choices. Try, try to love your family well. Hey, um, you know, hey, m make sure that uh, you, you don't forget to pray. You know, if, if we get around people who are just kind of dropping these, I mean, relevant because it, they're, they're true, but they're not really richly relevant to our context and to me as a person, it, what happens is we begin to hear wah, 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 wah. And, you know, we don't want to feel like we're 11 years old being told no 33 times a day. If we're going to empower people and see things and, and help them to avoid things that will bring damage to them and hurt the kingdom of God, we've got to know them well enough and know their context well enough to make sure that they're richly relevant to where they are. Well, this is not just like, you know, my idea. Check it out. If, if you have your, if you've got taken some notes, I'm going to give you a few of the verses that we read that show us that this is true, that, that Paul gave a richly relevant warning to Timothy. Verse 14, av be careful, avoid quarrels about words. Uh, av verse 15, avoid irreverent babble. Verse 17, watch out for Hemenaeus and Ph uh, Philetus. He just goes ahead and exposes by name. It's not like gossip, but he's like, yo, watch out for, you know what happened with these guys. Watch it, be careful. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Verse 23. Verse 14. Why? It ruins the hearers. Verse 17. It will lead people more and more into ungodliness. Look at verse 18. This one dude, he swerved from the faith. Verse 23. It upsets the faith of some. It breeds quarrels. Sorry, the first one, the second one was verse 18. But you get the point. Like, it's all through the letter. These are richly relevant to the context that Timothy was in. Timothy was in a context that, um, all right, Go back with me in time, right? So Jesus is around, then he dies, then he resurrects, then he descended, then the, the church is born, Acts 2, and, and we're, we're in this early church phase, okay? So it hasn't been a ton of time since Jesus was actually physically on the earth, okay? But it's been enough to where the pureness of the gospel message of Christ crucified and resurrected, that being life, that being central, it's been long enough where, where we've been able as a church, Timothy's like people, um, are, are starting to think about other things starting to get distracted. They're starting to make secondary things primary things. And it's, and it's beginning to like mess with the gospel. And, and that's the context that, he, that Timothy was called to um, basically church plant, pastor, whatever, like be in charge of this area. It's an area that was slowly, watch, watch, watch. It wasn't sprinting away from the gospel. It wasn't like Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. And they're like, no, I'm not done with that. I'm, I'm over here, you know, like I'm, I'm worshiping, you know, Baal again. No, no, no. It was like this. Jesus crucified and resurrected. This is life. This is central. Bring everything back here. Well, but it'd be cool if we talked about this. And it'd be cool if maybe we had like a little debate club over here on this. And well, what about this? I never thought about that. Well, that's what that person thinks. Man, I wonder what these three person think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out what they think about what this person thinks. And then what happens is slowly the gospel was being diluted and Jesus was becoming like among many important things and not the main thing. And here's what Paul tells Timothy in his context. As you see people start to go down that slippery slope, don't engage in that. You bring them back and yourself to the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified and resurrected over and over and over again. You want a better marriage? Awesome. Christ crucified and resurrected. How is that being played out in your marriage? You want to you walk, walk, walk differently in your parenting? Your kids are not in the place where you want them to be? Awesome. Christ crucified and resurrected. How does the gospel inform and transform that situation? over and over and over again. It's not bad to think about some of these secondary things. It's not bad to have different 
uh, opinions, if you will, over baptism or, or over the end times or over what this looks like. It's cool, and, and maybe you might have a friend where you, where you sort of discuss those things. You're like, I wonder, oh, I wonder, okay, I can see that. But here's the deal. Be careful, Timothy. Be careful as you empower those around you to not allow that discussion and those thoughts to pull you this far away from what is primary, which is Christ and Christ crucified. If this conversation is not pointing back to a resurrected Christ in your immediate life, it should probably be stopped pretty quickly. That's, that's the richly relevant context that Paul speaks into Timothy's life. What's the second one? Powerfully personal. Powerfully personal. This is like, hey, Timothy, I got something for you. That's what Paul is saying. As we, as we walk with people that we're trying to empower, as we want to empower this generation to empower the many generations, not just that one particular generation, we've got to be very personal. Not just, not just good about their context, but we have to understand who they are as a person. Look here at the passage. Here's what it says uh, in, in throughout the letter. In verse 15, do your best to present yourself as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of God. This is kind of what, what Paul continues to tell Timothy over and over again. Soldier up, eyes up, rise up. That might not pertain to you. Soldier up, Timothy. Eyes up, Timothy. You, Timothy, man of God, rise up right now. What that means is that Timothy was one that struggled with fear. He struggled with confrontation. He struggled potentially with some apathy. There was struggle in his life, obviously, so that Paul had to over and over and over again tell Timothy, not just every Christian, but Timothy specifically, soldier up, bro. It's going to be difficult. Get your eyes up. This is not about pleasing man. Rise up right now, Timothy. We need you. I can't make too many inferences about who Timothy was as, as a person be, because it doesn't say necessarily. These are just secondary observations that I'm making, but they are very personal to Timothy. So as we empower those around us, let us do it in a very powerful and personal way so that those people know that, that they're speaking into your life, not just speaking into life overall. The next one, prophetically proactive. Prophetically proactive. Look at this one. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. There will come times of difficulty. Verse or chapter 3, verse 5, avoid such people. Prophetically proactive. So these are not warnings that just tell people to stop. These are warnings. Now, when I use the word prophetically, um, there, there's, two, there's two senses to that word. There's the one sense where, where I'm talking about like, you know, like the Spirit of God sharing something with you that's consistent with the Word of God that speaks truth into their life that they, don't, they haven't seen yet and, and they don't know yet. And, you, and you're, you're sharing it because you know God, you know how God's working in their life and you know them. Okay? Then there's a second side of prophetically uh, proactive, which means like um, you, you just, you know these things because you're, you've lived them. You know what it's like to try to read your Bible after you're not excited about reading your Bible. There, there's that sense of prophetically um, proactive. And, and here's the deal. If we're going to empower with warnings that actually bring life to the people we're trying um, to warn and not sound like Charlie Brown's adult community, we, we, we have to have a sense of like, um, I know you and, and I know some things that, that are true and that you're gonna walk through before you actually walk through them. Uh, you know, I, I, I shared with you guys before that, um, a couple weeks ago, I think, uh, there was, my daughter went to prom, right? And that was super cool. And the guy that she went to prom with, it was a really good experience and all this stuff. He totally lived. There was no problem. Like, uh, there, was no, there was no pain. There was no weird, like, shotgun cleaning. It, like, it was like, this is totally great. He was, a, he was a good dude, you know? Like, a good dude. Happy for him. And, and you know, all, the, all that being said, I'm just going to stop right there. <laughs> but bef before that, before that, there was talk about, like, hey, so prom coming up and stuff like that. And, and I got to prophetically be proactive in her life. 
and we got to talk about some of the options that she might have, um, and we got to talk about, hey, so, so baby, uh, you know, is this a night where you want to go with uh, an identified player? And, okay, so you don't understand what I'm saying. You want to go with an identified player, and then, and then you have to spend all night playing defense? Like, because let me tell you something about prom night. Expectations are through the roof, especially for a player. Like, like and, and even though you are stated as this type of person, and everyone knows you as this type of person, understand that in this context, when alcohol is involved and when everything kind of gets elevated at, at, a, at a night like this, um, do you want to put yourself in that situation where although you just want to go to have fun and enjoy the moment, you're going to have to be playing this radical like man-on-man -man defense with this dude all night? Do you, do you want to do that? See, I was able to prophetically, because I understand the situation, speak some warning into her life and not just say, you can't go with this dude because I'm going to knock him out. You can't do that or get Travis to or whatever, somebody who can actually do it. What, what, what I mean, he would too. He loves me and I love him. What I mean is like, hey, babe, like you're, you're an adult. I just, I want to walk with you, but I want to tell you some things that I know are true that are going to help you to avoid what a good friend of mine t called an iceberg that could potentially wreck you. Do we know the people that we're walking with well enough to give them these prophetic, if you will, proactive warnings? And the final one, I'm going to ask the team to come on up because we're going to get ready to close and we're going to have some prayer here in, in just a minute. The final one is magnificently missional. Magnificently missional. Here's what Paul writes to Timothy, and he actually does this in chapter 4. He says this, As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Here's the thing that goes with all of these. It comes out in the, in the relevant thing, it comes out in the personal thing. If you're going to give an empowering warning that actually is able to speak life and bring life into somebody, the best way and the most gospel-fluent way to do that is to give them a warning based on their current identity in Christ. Does that make sense? It's so don't just give them random warnings that are good principles. It goes like this. Because you're fully accepted and delighted in based on the work of Christ and no work of your own, now you should avoid this. Now you should be careful about this. Now we don't do this anymore. Not in order to earn the affection of some father that you're gonna have to always wonder if, are we good, are we good, are we good? No, no, no. Because you already have that full affection and delight because of who Christ was and is on your behalf, now this is how we live, baby. Now this is how we move forward. Now this is what we avoid. And this final one here, I mean, it might be my favorite one. It's the magnificently missional one. As for you, fulfill your ministry. Be who God called you to be. Not who you want to be on your worst days and you get around those other people on their best days. Not who you see on TV, not the podcast you listen to, not this person or that person. I mean, here is the, one of the most beautiful ways that you can empower the people that you're walking with, the Timothys that you're walking with. Call them to be the full expression of who God has created them to be. Remind them that they are not just surviving today. Remind them that there is missional work at stake in their lives. I have had a person do this for me over and over and over again. His name is Dan Myers. And there was just a time he came to me and he's like, listen, it's time for you to go and take a class in seminary. I know you love reading People Magazine and watching sports and doing all like you're cool. Nothing wrong with that. He's like, I, I like your life. It's, it's, it's kind of refreshing to me. But, you know, I think you should maybe take a class in this thing that, that you love. And that began a journey that leads us here. I have somebody who was willing to say, your life is going to be magnificently missional, but you have to live it. You have to take steps to 
toward it. And even if you can't see them, trust me, I can. So the question we finish with is who are you helping to fulfill their ministry? What teacher or, or, or doctor or attorney or student or whoever it might be, what, what person who's early in sobriety and has that first job in their halfway house, who are you pouring into and coming alongside and saying, this is not the end. There is a beautiful ministry that I will look and help you to see along the way. You just come along because it's going to be magnificent and the world cannot miss you. So we're gonna ask some prayer partners to come up and we'll do our last song. And if, if you're in need, like Timothy was over and over again, maybe you've got some fear. Maybe you've got some things that hold you back and keep you from walking the path fulfilling the ministry that God has called you to do. Maybe you know that next step, but you're just like, man, you're kind of like Timothy. It's just easier over here. We would love to invite you to come and receive some prayer and, and just be encouraged to not stay where you are. Maybe you don't know Jesus. And this is like, man, if I can have a father that loves me, like you're talking about through Christ, that is exactly what I want. We just want to invite you to come and be prayed over here.